We welcome you to worship today, and as we do so, we acknowledge that Calvary United Church stands on Treaty 6 territory. We pay our respects to our elders, both past and present, wherever we find ourselves this morning. We recommit to our status as an affirming ministry within the United Church of Canada and strive to be an open-minded, inclusive, and welcoming place of worship. It is our deepest hope that all people might feel at home in this space, and we give thanks to God for this Sabbath day where we join our hearts and minds in prayer. approach in faith. Over these summer Sundays, we are drawn to images of God through the stories of those who seek to explain God and who God is for them. We also have our own experiences of the holy in our lives, even when we have no explanation for these moments. In our worship, through meditation and reflection, we open ourselves to the possibilities that abound as we seek to understand God. We seek to touch, however lightly, the mystery that is God present in our midst. In worship, we say to our Creator Christ Spirit, here we are. Fill us with the wisdom to understand your wide open embracing arms, O God. Be with us in this time we share as we explore the mystery of your grace and your love. Amen. Let us pray. May we enter into this time of confession with a willingness to be open to the holy three in one, aware of our true selves in our faith journeys. Forgive us, O God, those times when we have been deaf to the voice that invites us to abundant living. Forgive us those times when we hear clearly but refuse to follow, fearful of taking that first step into the unknown. Forgive us those moments when we simply reject what we do not understand rather than making an effort to learn and thus to grow. Hear us, O God, we pray, as we offer now our personal confessions to you in our silent private prayers. In these summer days, we celebrate God's light, a light piercing the darkness of our fears and our doubts. 
Here we offer our trust in God, choosing to live with justice, with truth, and with loving kindness. In Christ's love we pray. Amen. River running in you and me, spirit of life, deep mystery, dancing down to the holy sea, river run deep, river run free. River cry my name to me, lend me hope and memory, sing me the story. The good news reminds us not only that God loves us, but also that God calls us to love one another. We celebrate God's love through our generosity. In the spirit of our Creator's abundance for us, we share our gifts, the fruits of our labors in combination with the hope in our hearts that all might find healing and peace in God's abiding love. Amen. We continue to follow some of our social distancing protocols, and so we offer to each other this morning the gift of peace in whatever way remains comfortable for us, either waving our hands or touching our elbows, all while maintaining a safe distance. Peace be with you. Amen.
The scripture reading is from Joel chapter 2. Do not fear, O soil. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Do not fear, you animals of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green. The tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and the vine give their full yield. O children of Zion, be glad and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the later rain as before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten. The hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army that I sent against you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I, the Lord, am your God and there is no other. And my people shall never again be put to shame. This reading is from Second Timothy chapter 4. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The gospel reading today is from Luke chapter 18. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. Hear what the scriptures are saying to the church. May the thoughts that I share with you this morning and the ways in which we interpret those thoughts into our daily living be for us a gift to our creator Christ spirit as it helps nurture us and sustain us. Amen. Let us begin this morning by exploring the world of the prophet Joel. Sometimes I try to imagine what each of the prophets of Israel might have looked like. I think of Elijah as kind of a wild, disheveled looking, a wee bit scary. I see Isaiah as a proper scholar, well-dressed and speaking with knowledge. Ezekiel appears to me as a strong physical type, the kind of person who might work as a bodyguard in today's world. As for Joel, in my mind he appears to be a teenager, young and eager, and thinking he is ready for the world, but even in his youthfulness, is the world ready for him? 
It is with that image in mind that I absorb Joel's central message for the exiled Israelites. God is among us. I imagine this young teenager standing in a public space with a curious crowd gathering around him, listening with open mouths as he proclaims his news. How do they react to him? Isn't he too young to be speaking so authoritatively about the God of Israel? God who, to date, has always seemed somewhat remote, at best a kind of parent-knows-best figure, at worst someone who has abandoned them? Yet here is Joel, newly grown into his role as the prophet of Israel, saying the most astonishing thing, God is among you. I can relate from personal experience a wee bit to the situation which Joel finds himself in. I recall arriving at Garden City United Church in Saanich, part of Greater Victoria, at the young age of 29, and attending my first Victoria Presbytery meeting, where several of the retired clergy were initially somewhat unwelcoming. And one had the courage to express to me his opinion, probably shared by most of the others, that I had no business getting a call to a church in Victoria at such a young age. Calls to Victoria were reserved for experienced ministers who could then retire there. It was my introduction to the subtle pecking order that existed in the church back in that day. Fortunately, I weathered that initial animosity and by the end of my time at Garden City had earned the respect of all those doubting colleagues. So I have some empathy for a very young Joel, trying to be a prophet in the midst of people who all think they know God better than he does. That being said, I also think Joel is the right person to deliver this unique message, simply because people would notice him. He would stand out in a world where prophets are meant to be wise and therefore old, and he would stand out for a message that needed to be delivered, a message that has faint echoes in our United Church statement of faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. And moreover, as Joel articulates it, God is among us in the world. When we speak of Jesus, we might use the theological term incarnation, literally in the body. We believe that Jesus embodies God. We also believe that any of us, and indeed all of us, embody God, each in our unique way. Joel opens the door to that understanding of the presence of God. Joel opens the door to the worldview that the, the, the disciples had of Jesus. They understood because of Joel that Jesus could indeed be God and the flesh in their midst. Given the rich tradition of the prophets within the Hebrew faith, this incarnational faith was not that much of a stretch for Jesus' contemporaries. And it certainly was accepted by the disciples as being something familiar, even if rare. Luke offers us the parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee. In the unfolding of the story, Luke wants us to assess which of these two individuals shows more clearly the presence of God. Note here that it is no longer a question of if God is with us, but rather a question of which human framework can be seen to house God. Now again, I have a personal connection with this story. My mother was a tax collector for many years for Lanark Township in rural eastern Ontario. Given the relaxed attitudes of the day, the tax collector's office was simply our home and there were no posted office hours, so folk could come at any time of the day or night. They could come to pay their taxes. And there was always one fellow who came on the last day after 11 o'clock p.m., but still before midnight, and who always managed to walk through his pig pen before driving to our home. 
just to make the point that he did not like paying taxes. My mother, who could get quite angry at me over some of the things I did, nevertheless remained a calm professional through this annual experience, even finding humor in it as the years went by. So if nothing else, this experience taught me a respectful way to handle situations that were begging for confrontation. I think the taxpayer left each time saddened that he could not get a rise out of my mother. Fortunately, this character was the exception, and he certainly, if unknowingly, left me with a well-learned lesson. So who am I to say that God was not with him? Maybe God was there being patient with a human being who possibly required a bit more than the average level of patience, which my mother seemed to have reflected in this situation. In working my way through some of this, I acknowledge today also that St. Paul is a person who is worthy of my patience. My initial experience in Victoria should have reminded me of just how challenging it would have been for folk like Paul to talk about a new way of understanding God and God's relationship with human beings and our relationship with God. Messengers do have a challenging time. And Paul, as a unique messenger, does deserve my respect. In today's reading, we see Paul near the end of his life, and Timothy has taken on more and more of the burden of sharing the good news with others, even while we sense that he also is taking care of Paul, the student becoming the caregiver. It remains a model for all Christians that not only do we love one another, but we reflect love in the ways in which we care for others, especially in their time of need. This too is part of the gospel experience. This too is our way of affirming what the prophet Joel said so many centuries before Timothy was taking care of Paul. God is among us. God is here when we help our neighbor. God is here when we respond to emergencies such as embracing refugees into our community. God is here when we sit beside the bed of someone who is dying. God is here when. You can fill in the blank with your own experiences of when someone has been there for you. The good news includes this reality, that wherever someone is looking out for someone else, God is there. And we remain faithful believers as we open ourselves to others, thus participating in the reflection of God's presence in our world. May we find joy in this faith, and may we continue to be faithful agents of a loving Creator Christ Spirit who is here amongst us. Amen. Breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with life anew, that I may love what Thou dost love, and do what Thou wouldst do. Breathe on me, breath of God, until my heart is pure, until my will is one with thine to do and to endure. Breathe on me, breath of God, part of me glows with thy fire divine. 
we offer now a pastoral prayer. Gracious, gentle, loving, creator Christ Spirit, today we have listened, as is our custom when we gather in worship, to ancient faith stories of individuals who believed in you and whose faith filled them with a sense of being close to you, indeed abiding in your light and in your love. It is no light thing we do when we affirm you as Creator Christ Spirit, Word, promise, love. We celebrate the ongoing process of life, including our understanding of our own faith journeys, both individual and shared. So it is that we offer our prayer of thanksgiving for the possibilities inherent in each new day. We give thanks for the opportunity to make choices and to reflect our faithfulness within the choices we make. We give thanks for the ways in which our thoughts and our actions honor our beliefs and our values. We would understand more completely what it means to be named your children. We know that our journey includes a spiritual dimension that fills our lives with hope. Our faithfulness embraces a capacity to be at peace and to offer compassion to others. And we are grateful for this ability to look beyond ourselves to the wider world that is our shared home. We pray that you would continue to open us to the fullness of your creation. Open our ears to hear anew the proclamation of your love for all creation. Open our hearts to embrace fully and completely the journeys we take as individuals, as a faith community together, as people who believe in your light and your love and who wish nothing less for others as well. In our prayers, we think of those for whom life is a struggle for various reasons, untreatable pain, poverty, grief, injustice, isolation, loneliness, financial challenges. Open our hearts not only to the awareness of these challenges within other lives, but also to the possibilities we have to address these challenges. May your light and your love encompass our compassion so that we become, in these famous words, part of the solution rather than part of the problem. We pray as always, aware that prayer is central to our faith, and aware also that whenever we cannot find the right words, there is a prayer we can remember and we can offer, trusting that you, O oh God, hear us, even as we pray these familiar words. Our Creator Christ Spirit, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Gracious and sustaining Creator Christ Spirit, we experience yet again your call to reflect your light and your love in our shared world. Guide and support us as we echo our faith in you through our actions. Inspire us to be lively Christians, not only in our faith, but also, even especially so, in our deeds. Let us go then with the assurance that God goes with us. Let us live within the encircling warmth of God's embrace, rejoicing in the power of God's word, spoken and heard, received and lived. And to this, all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.